So uh, this is a little bit inspired by the discourse around Ethereum 2.0. I think radical exchange has been around a year, and I think it's start time for us to start thinking about the limitations of the existing ideas we've been putting forward and moving past them. And I think we need to do that if we want to take ourselves as seriously as technology takes itself. Um, and I think that we need to. So if you follow the history of technology, um, one trajectory, a trajectory I particularly admire, is one where we progressively move towards representations across long distances of human communicative interactions that are more true to the nature of the interactions that we have face to face. So you know, you start in long distance communication with clay tablets and we get a printing press and we get the telegraph and we get te um, telephone and uh, radio and television and video conferencing and with each one of these steps, the types of communications we can have with people across long distances get closer and closer to what we're able to have with people in person. Um, and I think there's a natural analogy between this and political economies. Because, you know, basically, if you uh, think back to early human societies, people mostly interacted with a group of people, a clan, whatever you want to call it, tribe, that were under what's called the Dunbar number. This is about 150 or so. This is the number of people that you can sustain serious personal relationships with over an extended period of time. Um, but in order to have relationships beyond that number, we needed some thinner way that people could keep track of to offer tokens that represent some element of what it is to interact with people in person. So you can think of money as a fungible, anonymous, uh, you know, quantitative measure of some notion of value, which is some element of what happened in these richer personal relationships. And you can think of identity cards and uh, other identity tokens, passports, etc., as a very thin representation uh, of some notion of individual identity or personhood uh, uh, that can travel across long distances. However, these are incredibly, incredibly thin representations of the sorts of relationships we have with people outside of the formalisms of the market and the formalisms of the state. Uh, when we are interacting with people under our Dunbar number in closer relationship to this, most of our relations are not about barter, which is modeled by money. In fact, there's a famous argument by David Graeber that actually there's basically no society that ever started with barter. Barter only emerges in societies that had money, and then when money broke down, they used barter to substitute for it. In, in reality, most of the interactions we have with friends and so forth are these really complicated things where we do things in many different overlapping groups that bring value to different people, and based on the dynamics of those interactions, we gain respect and esteem for people, which allows them to call upon us in the future to participate in different ways. These are not relationships about, I do this, you give me this back, and there's some simple, fungible account of that. And uh, you know, economic theory, if you really follow it through, wouldn't say that that's a good way to organize things either. The reality is that our relationships, our value, is created in these rich and diverse social networks. And what constitutes our identity is not some entry in a social security database, but rather the intersection of a huge number of characteristics that constitute who we are. Um, education, family, race, age, occupation, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, the identity tokens that just make us equally spaced atoms in some space of citizenship, and the money that makes us just a carrier of some unidimensional fungible value, are just like ridiculous reductions of that richness of social life. Um, and yet despite this, we haven't seen anywhere near the progress in the way in which we understand and keep track of and relate to each other that we have seen in our uh, communication technologies. So there's a great quote from Einstein about this that I recently came upon. He said, 
what in, at a 1932 disarmament con conference, he said, what the inventive genius of mankind has bestowed upon us in the last hundred years could have made human life carefree and happy if the development of the organizing power of man had been able to keep step with his technical advances. As it is, the hardly bought achievements of this machine age in the hands of our generation are as a dangerous razor in the hands of a three-year-old child. And I think that that's very much the problem that radical exchange is trying to address itself to. The, the social systems that we have are woefully, woefully poor representations of the richness of social life. And all you have to do to get a sense for that is read any of the like hundreds of brilliant social critics who have for years been tearing apart capitalism and the nation state. People like uh, Georg Zimmel, Hannah Arendt, uh, Anibal Quijano, uh, Pierre Bourdieu, Judith Butler, Chantal Mouffe. If you think that we are sort of like pretty close to an optimal system and we just have a few market failures to address, try reconciling that with anything that any social critic has written for the last 200 years, and, and good luck. Um, so today, what I want to try to do in the spirit of trying to show that while maybe radical markets types of ideas moved us from the telegraph to the telephone, that we're still way, way, way orders of magnitude away from the frontier, is to try to highlight that while radical markets, I think, had a very valuable function in bringing people like those in this room together, in inspiring a social movement that I think can be very productive, it was itself incredibly burdened with a whole bunch of economistic assumptions that I think are like really badly broken. And that if we wanna continue to develop these ideas, if we want further improvements, we need to start to move beyond those. And I'll highlight a particular uh, direction of movement that I think is exciting, and, and there are many others to look at as well. So what I'm gonna try to do is critique radical markets, uh, maybe tear apart a little bit of the foundations of some of the wonderful work that we've seen today, which I still think is great work, not because it's, uh, not because I want us to go back to the even stupider systems that radical Marx is trying to supplant, because those are even more dependent on these assumptions than radical markets are, but because I want us to realize that this is just a step. This is not a utopia. This is not the solution. This is one step of improvement in what I hope will be a long trajectory of improvement in our social technology. Okay, so I think one of the like core, if not the biggest flaw in radical markets is um, at its very foundation, that it is premised on something that is really the core of economic theory. In fact, I think you can think of economics not so much as a substantive field, but rather as the most extreme expression of a particular philosophy that is core to most of what's come in sort of uh, social discourse out of the Enlightenment. And this is an idea that I call atomized, liberal, and objectivist, naive epistemology. And, and as you guys, anyone who knows my title knows, I love backronyms. So this is, uh, al uh, stands for alone. Um, and the basic idea of alone is that there is some global level coordinating thing. Some people call this God, some people call this the state, some people call this objective reality, some people call this the blockchain. There's like a variety of different terms that are used for this global coordinating thing. And then there's like the individual. And of course, you can't really represent it in two dimensions because like the individual are thought to be equally spaced atoms. And to be equally spaced atoms, you can't actually do that in two dimensions. It's like this person is closer to this person. But like you're supposed to imagine some like, you know, n dimensional space where n is the number of people where everyone is sort of like equally orbiting about each other in some, some abstracted fashion. Um, and the thing that is like really weird about this vision is this is used in economics to model all sorts of things. It's used to model like the global order with, inter with countries in it competing. It's used to model the national economy with companies competing. It's used to model platforms with individuals participating on those platforms. It's used to model cities with individuals in the cities. It's used to, I mean, it's like literally, there's like at least a hundred different phenomena that are modeled by 
There is the global, you know, social planner. Social planner is another favorite word for this God-like thing. And then there's like the individuals within this. And, and there's like no social organization among them. Everything is just coordinated at this one level. And yet you're like, okay, so there's like 1,000 completely different entities at totally different scales. They're all being modeled as if there was no social structure underneath them, and they are the only coordinating mechanism that exists. Isn't that a little bit weird? Like, might that not be missing something? Um, and in fact, it's missing, for example, let's take a stereotypical member of this audience. They're probably part of a family, and maybe they live in Berlin, and may, or maybe they work in Berlin, and maybe they live in the state of Brandenburg, and maybe they're a citizen of Germany, and maybe they're a member of the Green Party, and maybe they work for Microsoft, and maybe they're a member of a church, and maybe they're a Turk, and maybe they spend a lot of time on Twitter, and maybe they participate in the radical exchange community. All of these are holes, gods, social planners, that are all somehow orbiting around each other and coordinating. And maybe we should be thinking about how actually one of these planners facilitates the emergence of a divert and cooperation of a diverse range of social organizations rather than just having the whole coordinate the separated individuals. Okay, so one way to think, to describe this is um, as a multi-level social organization. And Visualizing it geographically is, again, very limiting because much of this is not geographic, but geographic is a nice metaphor. And Joseph uh, uh, Potvin, sorry, uh, Joseph Lamke, who's in Radical Exchange uh, Portland, uh, has a very nice way of talking about this. He says that for every transportation technology, there's sort of like a distance that you're likely to go using that. For walking, you go a few blocks. For biking, you go you know, a mile or two, et cetera. All of these create patterns of interaction which then facilitate value creation and f require governance. And so you're just naturally going to have, as you get more you know, transportation technologies, many different layers at which you need to organize the governance of the social interactions that emerge from that transportation technology. And of course, that's just one thing. There's things on the internet, which are not primarily geographic. There's all sorts of different patterns that emerge. And we need a attempt to describe and to model and to plan for social life that accounts for this. So um, to put this in very reductive economic terms, what is wrong with the standard economic model? Well, in the standard economic model, everything that people consume, or almost everything, is what's called a private good. Um, but in reality, almost everything that we consume is a public good of some level, at some level of aggregation. So uh, almost everything that I consume, I consume together with my wife and daughter. Almost everything that my wife and daughter consume together with me, we consume with the city that we live in. Almost everything that the city consumes, it consumes together with the state. Almost everything that the state consumes, it consumes together with the nation. And if you doubt any of that, just look at how living standards vary across different things, and you just start disaggregating, and you realize most of the stuff lives at like progressive layers of social organization that are just like not the isolated individual. That has to be going on. And if that's true, it breaks the fundamental assumptions that radical markets is built on. Because radical markets has this mechanism design thing going on. And in mechanism design, what, what exists? Well, there's basically this thing called money, and there's this thing called like um, the mechanism you're participating in. And the, the fundamental assumption is that what you care about is how much money you get. This is called the quasi-linear utility assumption and you care about the allocation and basically some like utility it directly delivers to you. But this is just like not true in most circumstances because it depends who else is participating. If like I'm competing in a mechanism against my wife, given that if she gets money, almost all the things she's gonna spend it on, I am going to consume as well. It, it's just like not at all true that I just care about the money and about the allocation. What matters is who gets what exactly and how they relate to me. And this just completely breaks the like, foundational assumption on which all mechanism design is based. So let me give you an illustration of this. Think of an auction. So you know, Radical Market says auction is the canonical example. So what is the, the imaginary of an auction is you've got these equally spaced atoms out there. They're like competing, and you're going to give it to like, the highest bidder, right? But consider the following circumstance. Imagine that there's an art auction here in Berlin. 
And the four bidders in the auction are a public art charity, two people who work at the same blockchain accelerator, um, and a foreign government that thinks that this was stolen from, their, from the indigenous people there by Brit German colonialists, right? Um, like, treating those things in auction design as if now we're going to have this competitive market and it's just going to get allocated to the best person is like the most ridiculous thing you can possibly imagine. If one of these employees gets it and the other versus the other, like they hardly even care because they're just going to put it up in the co-working space anyways. And so it's just like, it's like literally, it's, uh, these are almost as if they're the same outcome. But now if it goes to the art museum, well, maybe that's not quite as good, but it's like pretty close to as good because they can just walk down to the art museum and see it, right? Now, if it goes back to the, you know, to the country that it came from, now they're like really out in the cold. So like these things are, and, and it could even get more complicated. It could be one of these employees is like, you know, a member of the Green Party and like really believes in indigenous countries' rights. And another one of these employees is like a um, you know really right wing AFD guy or whatever, and he really thinks you know this is Germany's heritage and whatever. So I mean th this this representation of people as equally spaced atoms that then supports this notion of an auction is ridiculous. Okay, and and that affects many core radical exchange ideas. Think about uh, salsa or cost or Harburger tax or whatever you want to call it. Um, the entities that are going to be owning things in salsa, possessing temporarily, partially, whatever, are not mostly going to be like the individual. There's no such thing as that, really. They're going to be families. They're going to be communities. They're going to be businesses. They're going to be all sorts of different entities. And they are not going to like view every other human being in the entire universe as like a plausible person who might come in and just buy their property, they're going to have very different attitudes and should have very different attitudes towards if that's someone who's a member of their community, if it's a member of their family, if it's a member, you know, et cetera, et cetera. All these relationships and where the revenue should flow from the salsa mechanism and et cetera, et cetera, are just like incredibly important elements of the design. So um, anyway, I, I won't get uh, too much into that, but I mean, like, you face issues constantly, like, should you allow foreigners to participate in the salsa mechanism? On what terms? Should the money flow to the nation? Should it flow to the local group? And I think the answer has to be some really complex overlapping hierarchy of answers like that, and not just like, there is the commons, and then there's the individual, and the individual pays some tax to the commons, and then it goes as a universal basic income. I mean, that's that's just a ridiculous way of thinking about the way that these should be implemented. Okay, another question like this. So this is my wife, Alicia. You're about to meet her if you haven't already. She's going to show up with my daughter at any moment. Quadratic voting and quadratic finance um, treat us like atoms, equally spaced atoms. It's the sum over the number of people, uh, over the people, of the square root of the amount that they contribute, right? You're going to hear lots about this. And this is a great technology, don't get me wrong. But do Alicia and I belong in the same square root? Or do we belong in two separate square roots? Are we the same person or are we different? Well, we're neither. We're sort of somewhere in between. Are two people in this room the same person or are they different? Well, probably closer to different, but like they're not, definitely not equally spaced atoms versus like someone in Tajikistan, right? Um, so. There, there has to be some representation of that social structure if we want to have these mechanisms actually in a plausible way facilitate cooperation. Because cooperation is just naturally, and not for any malicious reason, just in a purely just people obeying their self-interest way, going to be way tighter between people who consume everything together than people who have no social relationship to each other. Okay, so what's the right framework for addressing this? I think it's going to be eventually replacing money and individual identity, which you can basically think of as an n by one dimensional object. It's like a list of people with how much money is associated with each one of them with something that's more like an n by n dimensional object that represents a weight of relationship between different people. Um, and then there's going to have to be some rich mixture of sort of semi-quadratic and semi-linear things that 
depend on the nature of these social relations among people and that fundamentally encourage cooperation across d diversity rather than coordination of selfishness for the, the social good. Because there is no such thing as the social good and there is no such thing as selfishness. Neither of those are really coherent ideas. The only thing that really exists is people in different social settings who may come into conflict because of the lack of overlap of their social settings. Okay, so what's a formalization of this? We can, this is something that uh, we call intersectional social identity, ISD, but I've actually thought maybe it should be XD for like X is the intersection, but anyway. So the notion is that you can think of all of the data associated with you living in a personal data store. Uh, these personal data, things like your mother's maiden name, your city of birth and first kiss, however, are not just personal data, they're interpersonal data. Because for each one of these data, um, there are other people who, for whom it's just as much a piece of personal data for them. My mother's maiden name is also my mother's maiden name. It's my sister's mother's maiden name. It's my grandmother's date of the birth, I mean, uh, uh, it's my grandfather's last name, right? My city of birth is also the city in which on a certain date, a doctor delivered a particular child, right? and my first kiss presumably happened with someone else, right? And so um, you can think of, rather than this just being a personal data store, it forming a part of a, what we call knowledge graph. This knowledge graph shows for each datum a set of other people who store copies of this datum, who are linked, whose personal data stores are linked through that datum. And you can layer on top of this what we call a trust network, a credit network, it's sort of like an end by end dimensional money-like object that represents a sort of weight of an edge. If you want to interpret it in money terms, it would be how much would you be willing to lend to this person based on trust. So if you have those two primitives, I think on the one hand, this is a much better representation of the nature of individual identity because it, as Matt pointed out this morning, represents represents a sense in which all the things that go into constituting who we are are actually shared things. And, and that what makes us an individual is really the possibility of the intersection of all that social diversity. But this is also just like a really useful technical system. So if I wanna in an extremely secure way go into a bar and prove that I'm above the legal drinking age, rather than presenting a government ID and having all this stuff constantly being exposed to all these people, instead they could just have me prove through a network of trust that somebody who they trust or they trust someone who trusts, someone who knows that I am over the age of 21. And in fact, this happens all the time in informal social life for all sorts of sensitive things. But we don't have a digital infrastructure to support that type of social validation of truth based on, not on a global state like in the blockchain and global truth, but rather on a variety of different communities that each store information that they are able to collectively socially validate, not in a global way, but based on many different intersecting levels of sociality. Okay, so um, that's a longer term vision and eventually I think based on that stuff, we can build up and there will need to be many other inventions, something much richer than radical markets, something where really we take that end by end dimensional structure and build that as the way in which rather than having money or identity, we have this nonlinear combination of social data that generates the next um, you know, generation. And I think that you can prove in an economic theory where there's pervasive public goods that that is optimal. But what can we do in the meantime? until we get there. Well, I think we don't, we're not just stuck with uh, the first generation ideas. I think we can start to use them flexibly in ways that help us, based on these insights about the nature of social life, uh, do much better things with these. So for example, rather than basing quadratic voting or quadratic finance purely on everyone's an individual, they ju we just use the mechanism as is, what about the idea of if you're, say, voting on something for the company as a whole, treating everyone from the same division of the company as if they go under one square root, and everyone across divisions as if they go under different square roots. You can do that for quadratic finance, or you could do that for families, or just 
choose your group. Or you could start with just that very binary, you're either the same or different, and start getting more nuanced about that, using all the social data that we could potentially have about people, knowing about their social relations to each other, to condition the extent to which they're viewed as the same or different. So that this becomes a mechanism for facilitating cooperation across diversity, rather than just about individual conflict. You can think about versions of salsa, which inevitably, I think, are going to end up living within a complex hierarchy of different social systems, where people within a particular community have a right to buy within that community, and the revenue from that flows mostly to that community. But then that community pays a tax on that to some higher level community. But then if someone from the outside wants to come in, they have to buy out the whole community, and not just the, you see what I mean? Th things of this sort. Similarly, the immigration systems that we talked about, those were all visa between individuals program. But that's ridiculous, because no individual is going to facilitate someone coming from another country on their own. It's going to have to be done by some sort of a community. And if we just leave that to, quote, the market, we're just going to get monopolists growing up to fill that role. So if you can actually have a cooperative structure or a community structure that's the actual actor in that, I think it's going to be much more effective. And one thing you can naturally do in that setting is think about the notion of communities having sort of boundaries that are neither fully open nor fully closed with some sort of a price, but then paying a tax on that price to a broader community, which acts as a kind of harburger tax that disciplines something between open borders and closed borders. Um, I think rather in the antitrust section than just saying, we're going to break it up, we're going to have competition, you can actually say, no, if companies are going to grow and they're going to gain market power, what about giving voice to the people that they have power over rather than just exit? What about the idea of having something like co-determination, workers or consumers on the board as a remedy for market power? Um, and rather than just thinking about, in this, in this evolution you've already seen, rather than just thinking about data as labor, think about the social structure necessary for that, the unions and the collectives and so forth. So I think we can add on top of the ideas the social structure that's necessary to really work them out, even in kludgy experimental ways. And many people here, I think, should feel empowered to experiment in those directions, because they're going to make the ideas much more effective and help us find optimal solutions as well. Now, even that is just one example of all the things that are broken in radical markets, in our society more broadly. Uh, there's questions about liquid democracy, combining that with this. There's questions about, you know, quadratic voting, quadratic finance have this like one dimensional thing that everyone is submitting, and then somehow some decision gets made. But like, the reality is, you know, I'm not having a one dimensional conversation with you. I don't just like get up here and submit a number and then you have all the information you need from me. And I hope you wouldn't do that with your questions either, right? Like we're having a conversation and having better ways of representing that sort of nonlinear thing I think is hugely important. Uh, there's things about culture and language and representation, hugely important things to, to work on. So I think we need to really view radical exchange not as a body of policies but rather as a tradition of technology co-created by the people who help imagine it, the people in this room, the people in Bangalore who are trying to fix the water system there, people at Democracy Earth, Audrey who's coming this afternoon, James Fulton Keith running for Congress. These people together are the ones who are going to advance these ideas, and we need to take this technological participatory approach to our social institutions without, at the same time, taking any generation of those ideas as the fixed endpoint. But combine the rigor, the scientific uh, uh, rigor, the artistic imagination, the activism, and the experimentation that make this community so vital, and continue it to push forward to Radical Exchange 2.0, 3.0, and, and beyond. Thank you. All right, we have some time for questions. Does it work? Okay. So my first question is 42. Ah, yes. <laughs> no. but, but, but even better than that is like, um, what is it? Uh, 76, the one from the Madhouse joke, do you know that? Where the guy gets up and he like says jokes and they're like associated with numbers and people laugh at them. 
Oh, yeah. No, that's, <laughs> that's, uh, no but re real questions, like if, if you evolve, that's cool. Like, I mean, yeah. radical action as a movement, but what about the communities and governments that can't evolve at the same pace and then you just become like, like iPhones that change every year? You can't expect governments to run on iPhones. Um, I'm not sure about that. I mean, I think actually one of the big problems that we have as societies is that we're not updating our social technology with the same vigor that we're updating our digital technologies. And I think that actually having formal systems that are like that often makes it easier. If you have this thing where it's like, no, the only way you can get to be a good liberal democracy is to just like go live in Sweden for 30 years, that's not really very exportable. Whereas like some of the radical exchange ideas, because they are more formalized, like it's easier to bring them, for example, to, to you know, environments that have less developed democratic institutions like Ukraine, uh, who's, you know, the digital minister is going to be talking to us shortly. So that's my um, hope. Thank you, Glenn, for that incredibly um, thrilling talk. And it's really nice to see people, and people almost never do it, take apart their own ideas. Yeah. Um, and it's hard to do. Right. Thank you. Uh, maybe a follow up on that question, or, the que uh, or to put it a different way. But you can imagine, now that we can measure social interactions, let's say you have Facebook's data, uh, and on top of that, you add uh, a complicated quadratic voting system. The problem might be, though, is that ordinary people who cast their vote won't understand how that system works. Yeah. Isn't that a major issue? 100%. I think that's a huge issue. And in fact, there's like an attitude here that I would call the technocratic attitude that I'm completely opposed to, which is, is sort of like, OK, you know, what we're going to do is we're just going to like have the perfect information system. We're going to collect everything. We're going to optimize and, and everything's going to be great. And that's sort of like the Chinese government meets Facebook meets Google's sort of like worldview. And like, I'm not a big fan of that worldview, as you're aware. So I think that as we evolve these things, as we increase the fidelity, it is absolutely crucial that we 100% balance that on equal playing field with our ability to legibly communicate this information and these ideas out to communities to own themselves and reuse. I think the power of quadratic voting is actually that in a relatively short talk without describing this whole complicated system, I can like convey to I think a pretty reasonable audience just like ways in which you could weirdly experiment with this. Like that's what was great about like you know when Comanche sent out those like kits that people then used to build the Apple, you know, one and you know the first IBM or you know PCs was just that it was for hobbyists. People could just do stuff with it. And if things aren't legible, people can't do stuff with it. And most of the intelligence does not live in me or in the elite here or the people in this room. It lives out there in the communities that can use these things. So we have to not take the approach of just getting complicated and complicated and optimized and optimized, but instead take advances, boil them down to things that are really crystal clear that people can take as broadly shared concepts of legitimacy and then allow them to build things up from those. So, I, I know that it may not, you know, whenever you say add a little bit more complexity, it sounds like you're saying go all the way to like the panopticon, but that's really not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is take systematic, clear, comprehensible, explicable steps in a systematic way towards closer approximation of, of social life. Hi. Uh, I have a question about the evolution of formalism. Yes. Uh, and by uh, the, 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 uh, registry kind of, of, of accounts yeah. model to the N by N model. It doesn't seem like this n new model, e either the N by N one or the uh, shared data, kind of linked data one, neither yeah. of these seem to actually cover an example that you used in your art auction, mm -hmm. um, which is uh, uh, the, the issue of like uh, differing opinions about whether the foreign, uh, uh, the, the, the person who wants to reclaim it for a foreign uh, right, this isn't really a matter of tie strength, I don't think. Um, so you know, how yeah, I, 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 so I don't think it has. It will be represented to no extent by tie strength. Like my guess is that someone who feels that way is probably also going to have like ties to international organizations that they view as public good providers, which are in turn tied to those other. Th so if you have a thoughtful notion of tie strength with multiple levels of remove, my guess is it'll capture some of it, but. There's, there's like no question that the system I was describing, like I could tell you seven things that are still missing from that. Like 
Things are going to be missing from all of these things. And for precisely the reason Shiv said, I think precisely the wrong approach is to make the perfect the enemy of the good. I actually think making the perfect the enemy of the good is not just like, oh, that you're being an idealist. It is actually dictatorial, hierarchical, and authoritarian. Because it basically says the only people who are going to have access to this are people who can like, understand all the complexity. I think the, the necessity of boiling things down to simplifications that are nonetheless better than the current ones is like one of the most important and democratic mandates that you must have if you're going to enter into this space. So I 100% accept that this is oversimplified, and I can tell you many ways in which it's oversimplified. It is deliberately oversimplified, because I want to attempt to get something like quadratic voting, like these other things that I actually think could be something that could be a basis of widely spread legitimacy and not just panopticonism. Um, I would love to get questions from women. We've had three questions from men. Uh, it's uh, very important to me that we open things up if possible. All right, I have a question for you. Please, Pooja. So um, it seems like you're trying to facilitate more cooperation across difference by capturing our you know, embedded sociality. Yeah. But at the same time, in defense of radical exchange 1.0, money is also a great equalizer for somebody like me, who yeah. is a woman and, say, a person of color. Yeah. So um, do you think that there's, at some point, from when you're moving from point A to point Z, uh, that there could be um, uh, um, opportunity for or not even a mistake where there's even more social division or more yeah. tribalism that emerges from capturing our embedded sociality. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, technologies have uncanny valleys every so often, right? And, um, like, we have to watch out for those. And we need to experiment. And we need to learn. And we need to recombine. And we need to see failures and find better ways of doing things. And I think that is uh, precisely why you don't want a panopticon. Because no small group that defines what data, what values, whatever need to be observed and extracted from people is going to have the capacity to anticipate all the things that more broad social participation can allow us to imagine in these. And so that's a critical role for experimentation and so forth and not just theory. And so, yeah, some of these things might not be as good as the ideas that came before them. It doesn't mean we should keep stop trying to get there. Just as in you know, virtual reality and animation, we know there's an Inkenny Valley. We don't go into it more than a couple times. Uh, but maybe we still try to get to the other side of that Uncanny Valley as well. So there's nonlinearities. There's many things. And, and, and I don't think that the ideas and research small slice of this, which is sort of what I was presenting today, is most of what's going on. Most of what's going on is a range of other stuff. But we still have to keep pushing in that direction, I think. Um, yes, Maria. Thank you. Hi, Glenn. Um, great. I, I'm, I'm less familiar with this, with this work of yours. Yeah. I was wondering, better participation, how, how do you envision this results into better policy making? Um, well, uh, I mean, the way I think about it is that in terms of voting and things like this, so let, let's just start with the standard quadratic voting. Mm -hmm. Th there's basically like, you know, two perspectives on, quote, democracy and so forth that um, in any reasonable society end up getting sort of like mixed together and combined in some way. And quadratic voting is trying to give a mechanism for sort of like actually getting them sort of optimally to emerge. One is sort of like, people are dumb, let the experts figure it out, or let the people who really care figure it out, or whatever. And the other one is um, the people, you know, are the only legitimate source of power. And like every reasonable society is some mixture of those things in some complex, nonlinear way. But the problem is that like, each one of these is like profoundly flawed on its own terms. So you'd like to have something that actually like, in an egalitarian, democratic way, allows expertise to self-identify and emerge from the population. And I think that, and, and of course, I, I, I really am an epistemic egalitarian, pretty much. I think for everything that I'm like, think I'm smarter at than many other people, there's like 17 others that are, I'm like incredibly dumb at. Like, I don't know shit about sports. I don't know anything that's going on in my town in Hoboken. I'm just like a complete loser on almost everything in life. I just happen to have this like one area where like I know some stuff, right? And so. I think that like allowing that sort of expertise to 
emerge and to assert itself is the sort of thing that mechanisms like quadratic voting allow for, and the hope is that in an egalitarian and legitimate way, they allow for you know, ex expertise to emerge. More questions. Uh, when you were speaking about this uh, kind of social identities in, instead yeah. of individual identities, uh, I think you did not say about the case, and uh, it will be a case like yeah. when uh, uh, different social identities contradict or compete with each other. Oh, I don't think that's just a possibility. That is the central case that I am focusing on. And in fact, I think it is precisely those contradictions in social identities that makes human individuality possible. So I wear a Star of David around the neck that some of you may know. A probably smaller number of you know that I don't travel to the state of Israel because I object to the government and I don't buy products from there. Um, I, uh, I'm an economist and I think that economics is premised on a ludicrous uh, assumption that makes no sense and that the whole field is basically incoherent based on that. Um, I am uh, uh, sort of a, a libertarian, you know, and I think that libertarianism is like one of the weirdest and like most absurd political philosophies out there. I'm kind of a, you know, lefty and I think that, uh, you know, nation states should disappear. So, I mean, like, you know, that's just the nature of things. And in fact, like the, all the interesting people have those issues. So in some of my presentations, I talk about um, this guy, Amichai Laulavi, who is my rabbi. And he, um, he's the nephew of the ultra-Orthodox chief rabbi of the state of Israel. And at the age of 13 for his bar mitzvah was assigned the passage of the, uh, uh, you know, Deuteronomy, where they talk about the evil of homosexuality. And he used his bar mitzvah as an opportunity in front of the assembled clergy of the state of Israel to come out of the closet. Um, and uh, so like, that's what makes individuals. Without those sorts of contradictions, individuality would be impossible. And the, the fundamental evil, the, 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 the root of, if you want to say what I would say is the root of all evil, is the attempt to believe that it is the atomized pre-social individual that is liberated. Because what that always ends up turning into is the liberated individual brought to you by the French Revolution, the Coca-Cola Corporation, the Soviet Empire, whatever. And uh, that is always totalitarian. That wipes away any possibility of individuality because it is the complexity of social life and its contradictions that make it possible to be an individual. And so anytime anyone comes along telling you they're going to liberate you from existing social institutions, know that their goal is to enslave you to them. And that's a wonderful note to end on. <laughs>